There are six relay towers in Fallout 4. Each one relays different broadcasts that each tell their own stories. I've made videos on four of these towers so far. This is number five. On the far easternmost edge of the glowing sea is Relay Tower 0DB521. You can activate the Relay Tower by accessing the nearby terminal, which you can use to extend the satellite dishes. When you do, your Pip-Boy radio picks up three new signals. The first is Skylane's 1665 Mayday. The signal gets stronger as you walk southwest of the relay tower. Skylanes, 1665, 20 miles out. Roger, Skylanes, 1665, traffic short final. Clear to land on runway 18 left. Copy, 18 left. Coming in at 475 knots, that's 47... Uh, ha hang on, control. Uh, damn it. Fire in left engine! Uh, we're losing power in left engine! Okay, let's put it out. Left engine to idle. Shit! We're still losing power. That's it. No power in left engine. <clears throat> Boston Center. Skylanes 1665 declaring an emergency. Left engine failure. We're out 15-3 at this time. Copy that, Skylanes 1665. Request emergency landing. Clearing runway 18 left. Can you make it? Uh, that's a negative, Boston Center. Losing altitude too quickly. We will not make it to runway. 1665, say again? We're going down! I repeat, we're going down! Here we find the wreckage of Skylanes Flight 1665. I covered this wreckage in another video on all of the crashed flights of Fallout 4, which you can watch here. Through a hole in the bottom of the fuselage, you can access the luggage compartment. Inside, there are a number of locked suitcases you can open to take advantage of the scrounger perk. And in the front of the luggage compartment, you find a hidden compartment. It's easy to overlook this, as it's actually hard to trigger the dialog box. You have to hover your mouse over the top right hand hinge to access it. Inside you find a huge stash of ammunition and chems along with the Skylands smuggling manifest. We learn from the random encounter involving Ness, whom you can learn about in my random encounters video which you can watch here, that before the war, Skylanes smuggled chems and ammunition. Ness seeks your help, killing the raiders who occupy another crashed flight so that she can access this hidden compartment. Going upstairs, we find a stairway that leads to the cabin. In the cabin, we find the flight recorder, which has the last recording of Flight 1665. Approaching Boston from the west. We've got heavy winds, but it shouldn't be a problem. Lining up for runway two at heading. What the hell is that? Some kind of bright light from the north. The two recordings seem to contradict each other. The first is a mayday call, and the pilot does not seem to know why his plane is suddenly unresponsive. And the other is extremely short, and the pilot seems to see the first nuclear detonation from the Yangtze. And we are then to assume that that caused the crash. I'm not sure how we can explain away this apparent continuity error. Back downstairs and around the corner we find a hatch near the stairway to the cabin that we cannot open. This likely leads to the luggage compartment that we already explored. Explored. On the starboard wing, we find a circuit breaker. This circuit breaker activates a blinking red light on the tail fin. If you turn this on, flight 1665 will now have a soft red blinking light forever. But the Mayday transmission is still going on. How do we turn this off? Well, if you explore the back of the main floor, you find another hatch on the ground. This one you can access. Inside, we find more luggage. This is yet another luggage compartment. But on the wall, we find a second switch. This turns off the Mayday signal. Skylanes, 1665, 20 miles out. 
In my previous video on this topic, I didn't realize that at the time. I thought it was another switch that controlled the blinking red light. But no, this turns off the Mayday signal. While you're here, if you toggle the free cam, you can float outside the bounds of the luggage compartment to find a ham radio off in the distance. One commenter told me that when it came to these relay signals, that the way the game works is that the signals are all scripted to the ham radios. That is, they can't have a mayday call or a distress signal without a ham radio being in the vicinity. Sometimes they have to tell a story where there is no ham radio, like at the mass fusion containment shed, which sent out an automated alarm, and in situations like this, where the signal is a mayday signal from a crashed flight and not a ham radio. So what Bethesda did is they scripted the circuit breaker to turn off the ham radio when you flip it, and then they pushed the ham radio out of bounds. Near the crashed wreckage, you almost always find a wandering iBot. Unlike the one in the random encounter near Cambridge that talks about pre-war food, this one doesn't say anything, it just emits static. You can, however, hack this robot and turn it into a temporary companion. The second signal is the unintelligible radio signal. This radio signal is unintelligible by default. It's really hard to make out, but it does get more clear if you walk due north of the crashed flight. As you approach what appears to be a church steeple, the signal becomes the clearest. It sounds like heavy breathing, which is just a bit disturbing. You find that the church is sunken into the earth. This is strange. We'll talk about this in a minute. You can climb up onto the roof and peer through a hole in the wall to find a swarm of feral ghouls at the bottom of the church. These are likely responsible for the heavy breathing on the ham radio. The floor of the church is covered in oil, so if you use an energy weapon or an explosive, you can set all of the ghouls on fire. To find the ham radio, go to the back of the church past the podium. Near the podium, you'll likely find a key with a glowing keychain. Take it with you upstairs, and on top of some storage crates, you'll find the orange ham radio. Activating this turns off the broadcast. Interestingly, the heavy breathing that we heard continues even after all of the ghouls are dead. So either there's the ghost of a ghoul still haunting this place, speaking heavily into the ham radio, or I suppose it's possible that the ghouls accidentally bumped the ham radio and recorded themselves breathing heavily before accidentally sending out the transmission in a loop. On the nearby desk is a note that says office duties. Mrs. Klein was scheduled to take care of office duties for the church the night the bombs dropped, but for some reason she was called away. She left this note for Mrs. Hart, who came in to cover for her. She says that she's hidden a key to the safe behind her pew. Now, in both of the playthroughs that I went through when recording this footage, I always found the key behind the podium. I went to all of the pews looking for a second key and I didn't find one. The key you do find behind the podium opens the nearby safe, where you will find some randomized loot. Back downstairs, we find a bus pushed up against the door to the church. Inside, we find a steamer trunk full of loot and other duffel bags and containers to loot. But this brings me back to a point I began to make earlier. Why is everything in the glowing sea buried under feet of substance? I can think of only two explanations. The first is that there was some sort of eruption, and that all the nearby buildings were covered in something akin to a pyroclastic flow. Perhaps this came from the initial blast. Maybe one of the nukes from the Yangtze was so powerful that all of the soil and filth 
that was at one time inside the crater in the glowing sea was shot up into the air and rained down upon all of the nearby buildings covering them in burning molten soil and rock. It then settled and solidified, giving us the glowing sea we find today where buildings can be explored underneath the ground. The second option is that the nuclear blast compromised the structure of the nearby soil, which caused many structures to sink into the ground. I bring this up because not every structure is sunken. The Sentinel site, for example. Now at first it appears to be sunken, it's a giant pyramid, and when you enter through the main door you have to go down into the pyramid. But if this was a sunken pyramid, why would the door be halfway up it? That is to say, the only entrance into this pyramid is halfway up the pyramid, near the top of the pyramid. So if it had sunk, that means the people who built it built the only door in a completely inaccessible spot. If you don't know what I'm talking about, check out my video on the Sentinel site, which you can watch here. And the Sentinel site is arguably closer to the impact crater, which means that if the detonation shot out a bunch of soil, which buried all of the nearby buildings, the Sentinel site should be more buried than something farther away from it like this church. This makes me think that the most likely explanation is that the detonation somehow compromised the soil itself, making it weaker somehow, causing some of these structures to dramatically sink into the ground. But I'm open to being corrected on this one. It's certainly an interesting thing to think about. You can leave the church by ascending the bell tower. Next is the distress signal. This signal becomes more clear as you walk southwest of the Pentecostal church. Uh, Larry, Bucky, if you guys can hear me, stop messing around and come get me. Oh, I'm stuck in some shithole in the middle of the glowing sea. Wish I could give you better directions. Okay, okay, uh, Larry, remember that church steeple sticking out that we spotted a week ago? Go there. Turn southwest and walk until you find a cave. Ugh. It's hard to spot, and there may be a couple, but I'm in one of them. Ugh. Oh, that radiation hit was way more than I expected. Bring some Radex and a bunch of Rat away. I don't know how Bucky did it that one time. He must have had a better suit or something. From now on, no one goes into the glowing sea. Let Bucky's record stand. I'm too sick to move, so I'm gonna hunker down here until you guys get here. Here we find a cave. Not a natural cave made from erosion or an empty lava tube, but a cave made out of twisted steel, crushed concrete, and other debris, likely created in a haphazard way during the initial blast. As you explore deeper, you find a lot of glowing fungus and brain fungus until you reach a large chamber at the end. In here, we find the corpse of a raider on the ground next to a full suit of raider power armor and and the ham radio. This was likely a raider rite of passage, or some sort of machismo thing that the raiders did to show each other up. One legendary raider claims to have gone into the glowing sea and surviving and coming out again. His tale spreads around amongst all of the other raiders until it almost becomes folklore. And then to test one's manhood, raiders come out here in their meager raider power armor to see if they too can survive. This one, sadly, did not. Now in his recording, he talked about another cave. He said he was in one of the caves, but that there was another one out here. Where is this other cave? Well, you can find it by walking almost due north after leaving this cave with the raider inside. As you walk, you'll see a cave icon appear on your compass, and then just alter your course until you come across it. This cave is made in a similar way to the last one, only this one is partially submerged. There's about a foot of water at the bottom. At the end of a long tunnel, we find an upside down and wrecked bus with more glowing fungus and brain fungus. You can follow the tunnel out of the bus right until it comes out from underneath a wrecked road, landing you at the doorstep of a wrecked Red Rocket truck station. As soon as you exit, you are attacked by two rad scorpions, in my gameplay one of which was legendary.
The Red Rocket truck stop is interesting. This is about just as far from the crater as the Pentecostal church, and yet the door is level with the ground. It's not buried under feet of earth. It also looks to be tipping, kind of like a ship that is capsizing. It leans to the left a little bit, like it's sinking into the earth. I think this is more evidence to support my theory that the earth around here has somehow become compromised, unable to support heavy structures as it once did, causing all of the pre-war structures to sink into the earth a little bit. The truck station itself is an interior cell, and it is beautiful in here. It strikes me how the light from the dangling fluorescent light bounces off of the water and casts these dancing reflections on the walls. It's a really nice touch by Bethesda. Since it is slanting, the water collects in the western portion of the truck stop, and inside the office we do find one master locked safe. In the garage, the switch to the garage door is located on the wall, and it does work. The garage door will open, allowing you to loot a wooden crate in the back of a wrecked car. I I like the inside of this Red Rocket truck stop so much that part of me wishes you could turn it into a player home. Not everyone would like to live out in the glowing seas, but I'm sure there are some who would. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the full story of Relay Tower 0DB521. This has been one of my favorite Relay Towers to explore because I love the Glowing Sea. Frankly, I wish there was more to do in the Glowing Sea. I wish there were more structures to explore, more interior cells to explore, because what we do have is very interesting. That, ladies and gentlemen, finishes off five of the six Relay Towers, leaving one more to go. So be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you get notified when I publish that video. Do you have your own theories about why so many buildings are sunken in the glowing sea? Let me know in the comment section below. I read all of your comments and I use them as inspiration for my future videos. And if you'd like to discuss this topic with other like-minded individuals on the Oxhorn Community Discord server, be sure to click on the invitation link in the description of this video. You can click the little show more banner to twirl down the description to find the link. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad that you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.